Hi, and welcome back to your neighborhood group. We hope that you've had a great Christmas and New Year break. Uh, we also hope that you've been able to, to reconnect with family and friends and really enjoy your time together. I also hope that you're anxious to reconnect with your group again. Uh, it's been a little while since we've, we've had a chance to connect together, so I hope that you're gonna take advantage of this time to get reacquainted. Also, I hope you're excited to re-engage with God's story. I know that we've taken a couple weeks off of groups, and so I hope you haven't taken a couple weeks off of your readings. Uh, first, you're probably wondering about the backdrop that's behind me. It's obviously not indigenous to, to Phoenix, Arizona. I'm here in Bulimbu, Swaziland, and I'll explain a little bit more about why I'm here in just a couple of minutes. But first, let's start off by just getting reacquainted. A uh, couple of easy questions to get your discussion started today. First, just recap your Christmas and New Year's. Maybe share some of your highlights and how you celebrated with family and friends. And secondly, this one's a little bit more difficult. I want you to share a goal that you have made for yourself in 2013. It could be something personal, it could be something professional, it could be something spiritual, but why don't you start off with those two questions just to get the ball rolling today.
Now to explain this backdrop that's behind me. As I said, I'm in Bulimbu, Swaziland, and Swaziland is a pretty unique country. In fact, it's one of only six absolute monarchies left in the world. What's an absolute monarchy? An absolute monarchy means that the nation or country is ruled by a king. Now, there's lots of countries with kings, but an absolute monarchy simply means that the king has supreme power. They have the power to appoint and also to fire the prime minister. This king, uh, just like many other kings, is clothed in luxury. In fact, I've, I've been told that he has 14 palaces, one for each of his wives. Uh, I've been told that uh, you know, he has a gold-plated Rolls Royce, just an awesome spectacle to be king. Now, I know that we're studying a chapter this week on Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus had many titles, and among them was Messiah and King. But as you're going to find out, Jesus wasn't like any other king that the people of Israel had ever seen before. And so what I'd like for you to do is just take a moment and do some reading and discover how Jesus was different than other kings. As you can see from that reading, there was a lot of confusion regarding Jesus the Messiah because he just didn't fit into the mold of past kings. In fact, when they saw a lot of things in Jesus' life, it just didn't make sense. For example, there was his conduct, things like miracles. You see, when they saw a man behaving like God, it didn't make sense. In fact, there was even one passage in the New Testament where Jesus uses his conduct, uses his miracles as powerful evidence that he is God. In fact, he says, if you don't believe me, if you don't believe in my testimony, at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. So there was his conduct. There was also his service. I mean, let's face it, kings just don't act that way. But Jesus Christ said, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. All you have to do is look at the way that Jesus put others first, the way that Jesus cared for the sick, the way that Jesus healed the lame, and know that it was all about service. So when people saw a God behaving like a man, that didn't compute. So again, Jesus wasn't like kings of the past because of his conduct, but also there were his claims. I mean, let's face it, Jesus made some fantastic, some outrageous claims. Jesus claimed things like, I can destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. But Jesus, of course, was referring to his body. I could destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. He made claims that he could forgive sin. People knew that was preposterous because only God could forgive sin. Jesus also claimed that I am the living water. And he said, whoever drinks from me will never go thirsty again. Friends, those are some outrageous claims. Make no mistake, Jesus, he wasn't just crucified for his conduct. He was crucified because people didn't believe his claims. After all, he claimed to be the son of God. He claimed that he would rise again. Are we going to accept that message or reject it? You see, the plot of God's story all along, as we've been reading, is that people would be able to see God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so as we get ready to start this year off, knowing that that's the plot of God's story, let's pause and ask that right now. What discipline will you make? What action will you take so that other people will be able to see Jesus Christ through you in 2013?
You know, we learned a lot in this week's reading about Jesus, the Son of God. And we learned a lot about the differences between Jesus and other kings. We learned about this ongoing battle, this tug of war that was taking place as people were trying to figure out who Jesus was and what he was called to do. I think one of my favorite passages from this week's reading has to be when Jesus Christ was defining what it really takes to be a follower. Let's look at that together. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. The point of that verse is that following Christ isn't easy. It involves sacrifice. It also involves putting God first. Maybe you can relate to the sacrifice part. In fact, maybe because of your values, it's kind of narrowed the scope of the people that you're going to date. Maybe because of your integrity and the way that you're going to go about doing things at your place of work, that, that maybe it costs you a promotion. Maybe you can relate with what it's like to put God first. And that means in every area, including your finances. Maybe you're looking at your budget saying, hey, that's great that I'm putting God first, but man, 10%, that's a challenge. Maybe you look back on 2012 and you realize, man, I need to, to do a little bit better when it comes to attending church every single weekend or even making a commitment to attend weekly at your neighborhood group. Sometimes that's a struggle. All of those are different ways that we can put God first. You see, friends, the bottom line is that this verse is all about the cost and the rewards of being a follower of Jesus Christ. So let's take a moment and just discuss that right now. What has following Jesus Christ cost you? In other words, when has it been a little bit difficult sometimes to be a Christ follower? And also, the rewards. Let's talk about some of the rewards that we've experienced from putting Jesus Christ first in our life.
Today we've learned a lot about Jesus, the Son of God, how he was different than other kings of the past, the different claims that he made, and the way that he conducted himself. But this week, as you know, around Christ Church of the Valley, we've also had a big emphasis on serving and on missions. And so just to set the scene real quick, as we get ready to wrap things up, we would simply want to ask you one question. Will you commit? Will you commit to make a difference? Will you commit to impact someone other than yourself? What if we decided to make an impact for other people? What would that look like? What would your family look like? What would your neighborhood look like? What would this church look like if we served like Jesus? Hi, I'm Larry Fraley. You're probably wondering why we're shooting a neighborhood video in Africa. Well, as you know, this weekend we highlighted missions at CCV. The truth is, when we started preparing for this weekend, we realized that CCV would have boots on the ground in 12 countries in just the last four months. Malimbu is just one of many places that CCV is making an impact through your tithes and offering. In fact, CCV is making a global difference by sending our resources and people to advance the cause of Jesus Christ around the world. In Austria, where CCV supports TCM, a ministry committed to raising up leaders from Eastern European countries. In Calcutta, where hundreds of pastors were trained just this past month in leadership principles to reach the people in India for Jesus Christ. In Uganda, where Pastor Don just returned from training thousands of pastors in biblical leadership principles. And of course, in Rocky Point, where hundreds of CCV attendees build hundreds of homes in the barrios in Mexico. And in Ireland, where CCV started a church in a country where Christ is absent. And of course, Balimbu. In 2005, CCV was instrumental in purchasing an entire town. And over the last several years, that town has been transformed into a thriving community where Christ is on every street corner. And those are the places where God is working today. I just returned from Haiti, and in 2013, we'll be taking mission trips to Haiti to help with the devastation that took place due to the earthquake. I'm also in the beginning talks with ministries in Iran and Iraq, and Pakistan. CCV is going around the world. While it's true, we offer many opportunities for you to serve Christ in any one of our short-term mission trips. You don't have to go to another country to serve like Jesus. He has called you to make a difference right where you're at. This year, we're going to challenge you to commit to three things. First, pray for our missionaries around the world. Second, take the next step in your adventure with Christ. And number three, reach your neighbors for Jesus Christ. What would it look like if we served like Jesus? Thanks, CCV, for making a difference around the world.